Four against two. I like those odds. <laughs> hey. Uh, welcome. And uh, we'll start with a question about where you're at right now. Um, you guys are finishing a leg of the tour uh, for Head Carrier. How's it going? What's next on the agenda? The tour is going well. We'll be going on another tour. <laughs> is, is that pretty much the, the, what is in the foreseeable future? It's an future? industry standard. <laughs> And after the tour, will you, are there, is there talk of making a record, or is that after another tour? In between the tours, <laughs> I don't know which tours in between, but yeah. You'll squeeze it in. <clears throat> well, there'll be plenty of room for everybody. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, Charles... You've uh, quoted saying you'd like it if listeners uh, tried to remove themselves from narratives that they might have had in their head about the band. And uh, I was sort of wondering, could you expand on that? Is that just um, that, that, that you want them to see this, this band the way it is now in a, in a different light? I don't know. I mean, I... <clears throat> I said something in an interview, but I can't conjure up what it was that I said, because sometimes I kind of just kind of riff a little bit, yeah. maybe have a couple of espressos before the interview. So anyway, ask me anew. Or <laughs> I might be able to tap into whatever it is that you're quoting there. Sorry, I just don't know what you're quoting there. So I don't, I'm not in touch with that feeling is what I'm trying to say. Okay, Brad. okay, man. Does that make sense? Yep, yep. Well, let me, let me, let me try and get him in touch with the, with the feeling. <laughs> Do you, obviously, um, you guys have a, built a great body of work that people want to hear. Um, Do you ever wish that you had a tabula rasa where you were freed from having to play songs from your past and just like, oh, we're, we've got a whole new concept record or a whole new... Or are you just grateful that you actually can go out to people who enjoy your music? I, I think I can speak for the whole band. I, I think that we have a pretty uh, simple notion about what this is all about. Like, we know that the Beatles stopped touring at or such and such a date or whatever, but if they were to assemble today, for example, magically and perform, and we were in the audience, I might say to Joe, gee, I wonder if they're gonna play I Wanna Hold Your Hand. You know what I mean? And he might say, I wonder if they're gonna play Glass Onion. You know what I mean? So we don't really have any expectations or anything that we have to tweak about all of this showbiz stuff. You, you do this tour and you make some songs and you go sing them and all the sort of there's no there's no pressure coming from anybody you know we're just very happy to be doing this as opposed to shipping and receiving <laughs> as you should be yes uh, although i did enjoy that phase as did joey <laughs> right joe <clears throat> i did i'm a i'm a i'm a good worker mm -hmm. um there's only one way to find out about that, actually, for the new material and stuff, is um, the number of people that go to restrooms uh, when we start playing the new stuff. Well, I mean, it, it looks like you have in your set list that you rotate most of the head carrier songs mm -hmm. through. Are there any that you feel have really connected and any where you really see the, the, the rush towards the concession stands? I, I can say that. From my riser, I have a good viewpoint of the audience. <laughs> and I have, Head Carry works in very well with what we're doing, with all, all the old songs and everything like that. I don't see anyone going to the bathroom or anything like that, so it's all, they're all grooving. Really? Along. Not even one? There's not one? Well, Come on. Maybe in the back. Maybe uh, My eyes is not great nowadays, but yeah. <laughs> but, but it's still good. It's, 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 well, that's, your, you know, that's, that's good. I'm happy with it, so. Cool. Um, <clears throat> you know, the album... Uh, Head Carrier begins with the song Head Carrier, which is a uh, reference to a decapitated saint. 
And uh, it ends with all the saints. And I was sort of wondering, you know, what does the idea of a, of a saint mean to you? And do saints still exist? I don't know. <laughs> See, uh, saints, we like to stay at the Terrasse Hotel there in Paris, you know, on the, on the Montmartre, you know, where uh, by the grave, you know, Jim Morrison and Edith Piaf and everybody's right there across the street from the hotel. And Stiv Baders. Stiv Baders. But, um, but the Street of the Martyrs goes right, right by there. And that's where Saint Denis uh, carried his decapitated head down the hillside there in uh, whatever year that was. But uh, so anyway, I don't know, maybe our destiny has been after staying in that hotel so many times over the years, hanging out there at the Street of the Mars, maybe it was, maybe there's something, something about uh, the ghost of the, those uh, stories or whatever, you know, the ghost from those stories that eventually compels you. Okay, you'll work. You guys got a band, you're gonna do a song. <laughs> About me, <laughs> right? I mean, that's how I think about it, if that makes sense. I'm a saint. Are you? Uh... Santiago. Yes. <laughs> saint, saint James. Do you guys believe, uh, believe in, in, in modern day saints? Is there somebody in your life that you feel like you could be, you could they be, is you a could, sanctified person? You could be saint-like. You know, yeah. you probably won't get canonized, but, you know, <laughs> I mean, you can, certainly some people, I, you know, some days, you know, you bump into someone that does something really cool for you. Yeah. You know, that's good enough for me. Uh, one more question sort of on that topic. So in many interviews, which I will not quote, um, y you've mentioned your writing process, more or less. And then in this record, uh, on Una, you actually directly name check automatic writing as, you know, something that would be cool, something that is, you know. Uh, do you, is that still one of your big influences when you're writing lyrics, surrealism, etc.? I don't know, but Paz can tell the story better than myself, but we actually, uh, Re recently went to go visit the this little house that's scheduled to be bulldozed where the first sort of official automatic writing anyway uh, was started, right? Yes. And what was, the name of the, what was the name of the lady that took us there? She's kind of the historical lady, historical society lady in the neighborhood, you know. Yeah. What about Monique? the story? I don't know, <laughs> we had really... The Surrealist, the Surrealist house. Yeah. yeah. It was like Breton's house or... Um, so no, it, it, the, the, the house was owned by this guy, Paul Eloward. Okay. He lived there uh, with his wife, Elena, and the painter, Max Ernst. A very teeny tiny house. And uh, anyway, they're going to tear it down and everything. But we were, Paz and I were the last people to go into the house. Uh, this uh, little old lady, she opened it up for us and showed us around, right? Yes, it was uh, definitely going to be demolished soon so it was great to see the house but what, what is the story Charles? what is the story yes. about the automatic writing yes oh well you know because that's where they first did it you know was at this house because paul had a house because his dad was in the real estate business <laughs> ah. so he was oh, the only surrealist that had a house if you know what i mean so so they kind of that's paul. where they partied and hang hung out and did all their stuff their stuff know. well i'm going to ask i'm going to ask i'm going to stay on this topic <laughs> um so like in head carrier you know i mean there's there are sort of these random in the lyrics you know sort of associations that would seem sort of random to me where you mention these people and phrase like you can't be too chill you can't be too zen and then i'm going down the drain again now some of these like when i'm listening to it, it feels a little disassociated. But I was wondering, do these have real connections for you? Or is this, um, 
or, or, or do you discover new things in, in your own writing? Do you leave them open-ended for people to bring something to? Well, open-endedness can be nice, you know, because then one day, 10 years down the road, you know, you're going through something else in your life, and you go, oh, that's what the song is actually about. It's about what's going on right now. I didn't realize that. I was prophesying my own life. Yeah. And now I see. But it doesn't happen that way with every song, of course. Mm -hmm. So the song that you're referencing, for me personally, is very uh, specific to the story that we're talking about there of San Dani and his two uh, sidekicks, uh, uh, Rusty and Luther, you know, who were also beheaded with him there. And um, so the song is told from their, their perspective. Uh, uh, from one of the sidekicks uh, from uh, from Luther's uh, perspective, you know. Oh, so the narrative sort of changes. Right. So uh, here we go again, going down the drain again. You know, oh, we're in trouble again. They're gonna <laughs> they're gonna throw us in jail again. They're gonna, oh, they're gonna behead us now. All right, here we go. Oh, the copperheads. You know, it's just like kind of like, here we go again. You know, mm -hmm. uh, kind of a stressful existence, I guess. It's, I'm guessing it was probably for them. But uh, anyway, it's very, an very Laurel story. and Hardy sort of. What's that? Very Laurel and Hardy. Kind of, you know, <laughs> a little, a little, a little bloodier, I suppose, than your average Laurel and Hardy film. But yeah, uh, yeah mm -hmm. at least in the end, there. So, uh, uh, Paz, you've joined the band. I was sort of wondering how <clears throat> having a new member. Uh, has energized or, or changed the band in any particular way? Joey? Have I energized you? Yeah, she's made me play better because I don't want to be embarrassed around her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And she's, yeah, she's wonderful, yeah. Yeah. Plus, being a new woman, we're all behaving extremely well still. So, <clears throat> has it uh, changed your drumming to be playing with somebody who is perhaps a more traditionally skilled bass player in terms of like pocket or groove or how you're well I think her sensibility I mean playing these years previously copying the bass parts of what we played you know she was great at, she's great at doing that and then with her new thing she's become a pixie so it's really she's I mean like I say she's making me play better um, she's she's got she's the way she's playing it She's not like Getty Lee up there <laughs> doing what she could do and everything, but she's applying her pixie taste to it. So it's all been working out greatly for me, at least. So, um, so uh, Paz, how do you feel about uh, how is this experience playing with this band different than some of the other uh, bands that you've played in with the pa in the past? Uh, I feel uh, Pixies really completes me, as if all the things that I've done in the past has led me to this place and. Now I'm able to show up and uh, continue. Tell him the surfboard story, oh. Paz. <laughs> he loves the surfboard story. It's a good story. Once upon a time, <laughs> uh, I um, auditioned, for lack of a better word, for the Pixies. And I was in between trying to you know, figure out, is this my fate? Am I supposed to you know, be in this band? And um, I was waiting for my call, you know? And I was surfing at my favorite spot in Southern California called Sano, San Onofre. And um, I saw one of my favorite surfers. I don't know his name, but I saw him uh, out in the water. I was like, oh, you know, I'm going to have, at the time I was smoking, I'm going to have a cigarette and watch him surf, you know. So I'm, you know, he, and, he, and he surfs without a leash, a long board, one fin. And he was surfing, and he lost his board. Without a leash, that means it's going to go into the rock. So I ran to go save his board. And as I caught it, I put it to the stand, I flipped it over, and it said P-I-X-I-E-S, all across the board. And I looked at it, I was like, oh, this is a definite sign. Here I am, like, <laughs> running to save this guy's surfboard, and it says Pixies on it, right when I'm waiting to hear from um, the band. And I was like, oh, well, definitely I'm supposed to be in this band. So, anyways, here I am. And then your phone started ringing like right Yeah, now. it was like going off, you know, like. <laughs> you had three missed calls when you got back to your phone. 
did you guys feel recording that the that the dynamic was different than other Pixies records? Having a, a, a person that you couldn't sort of immediately revert to old behaviors with? I mean, there's a certain amount of a group dynamic that is inescapable. And sometimes having a new person makes you look at it from the outside. I think it might be simpler than that for us in that I think, for me anyway, from my point of view, it seems like a lot about being in a band is sort of uh, uh, sharing or having some overlap in your sense of humor, you know? So if there, so the, a band sense of humor develops uh, among the, however many people in this case, it's four people, it's the only band I know really, but you know, there's a band sense of humor, so when Paz uh, came into the band. She immediately, you know, fit into that. You know, wasn't any sort of. Uh, just seemed like, oh yeah, she's always been here because she gets the joke, or she, you know, we get her joke, or whatever. It's just sort of a, I don't know. It's just a general feeling, and um, so once you have that kind of down, then everything else is kind of easy. It's when people don't have the same sense of humor. I think it, it can, um, it's harder. It's like a bad date. Something like that. Um, <clears throat> you know, this, the, the story of the Pixies sort of start with, uh, you know, Charles and, and Joey. And both of you guys are, you know, unorthodox in, in your approach to uh, writing and playing. I was sort of wondering, and what was that, what was that initial, um, you know, attraction? Did Joey, did you like, recognize something special in what Charles was doing? Yeah, uh, right away. Yeah, of course. I wouldn't have dropped out, put it what, that way. What's that? I w would not have dropped out of college. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, I weighed out my options. Uh, I didn't weigh them that much. I mean, I mean, it was, it was, it was pretty obvious, you know. I actually went to uh, college to, uh, to start a band, really. Yeah. That was my main goal, you know. Seriously, I, I, I didn't bring a guitar with me on the first semester because I wanted to solidify a good bass GPA before I screw <laughs> things up, you know. That was the plan. Yeah. Uh, Charles, I mean, when you heard, I know that specifically you wanted to work with Joey. What was it in his guitar playing that you heard that you were like, okay, this is the guy that can help me sort of realize my, my songs, my vision? Well, again, you know, it comes down to a lot of, I mean, you know, he likes music, I like music, he's got a guitar, I got a guitar, he wants to start a band, hey, I want to start a band, how could we start a band? You know what I mean? It's, it's not like I'm sitting there assessing, I mean, you know, let me give you an example. And we're both we, funny. Do you remember? Yeah, same sense of humor, you yeah. know, our overlap anyway. <laughs> you know, we went to go see a guy who was going to be in our band. I was telling Paz the other day, we went over to his dorm room, and he had heard that we were going to do something, and, you know, he was had something creative to do, too. And um, The one with the big the beard? He had a big yeah. beard, yeah. and uh, and he and we were there to, went to, I don't know if you remember this, Joe, then he, we went to, went to go meet him, and... We didn't even know what musical instrument he played, if any, or whatever. I think turns out I think he was a bit, he was a bit of a singer. So anyway, just right in the middle of the conversation, he just started doing a cappella, full on a whole <laughs> medley of uh, Beach Boys songs. Uh, no, I excuse me, was, no, Bee Gees, yeah. Bee Gees. Yeah, Bee Gees. Yeah. It was Bee Gees. It was all it was all you know late '70s era falsetto disco period, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, which, in hindsight, now I kind of give him a lot of credit for. It's like this is gonna—that's I know what I'm gonna sing. I'm gonna sing, <laughs> you know. But at the time, we were like pretty horrified. We were just sort of like, "Oh, wow, this isn't kind of like we were thinking like this at all," you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we didn't say that to him. We sat and we we listened while he sang all these uh, Bee Gees numbers. And um, anyway, but you know, we didn't have a discussion. He's not going to work out, is he? I mean, we didn't even have to say that. It just, it's obvious, you know. So you just kind of like, yeah. you know, you kind of, you know, whatever. Uh, we we, uh, we want to start a band. All right, let's start a band. You know, I wrote him a letter, actually, 
I wrote Joey, do you know we, did you believe that we used to write letters to each other? That's crazy. I know. I wrote him a letter because I was, uh, I was uh, at another uh, college for a little while, and I wrote him a letter, and I said, uh, let's start the band finally. Let's do it. <laughs> and he wrote me back. He said, okay, <laughs> let's do it. We will meet in, we, we decided to go to Boston, you know, and uh, I guess probably because we were more familiar maybe with that city, say, than, say, New York or whatever like that. I don't know. That's, that's, is that why we went there? I don't know why we went there. I remember uh, us going to uh, UMass, and um, you went with me to uh, withdraw out of uh, school, you know, withdraw. Not really drop out, let's withdraw, just take a temporary leave. What uh, specific would you say if there was like one piece of musical DNA that each of you brought? Like what was the record or the few records that were really what you wanted to replicate with this band? Were there any bands that you were like, these are our touchstones? I mean, for me, I, I was just, um, I guess there was a union of... Uh, uh, a genre, and I learned a lot from uh, his Charles's record collection. You know, you had Angst, you had uh, uh, what's that, Larry Norman? Yeah, and Charles had a was a DJ at um, at um, right? You were, right. yeah, you were a DJ, and I read the liner notes, and uh, at times, one time I bought him a meal. <laughs> I mean, uh, a meal. I cooked him a meal of venison. And tang, but but the but the venison, my my roommate shot the venison, the the, the deer, and I said that's a little thing. He goes, eh, it's not, it's a full grown thing, whatever. But um, I, I I I put it in the, uh, I put it in a baggie, the uh, the venison, and I just handed it over. It looked like evidence, you know. So he didn't really, but anyway. And you didn't use it was a memorable meal. It was a memorable meal. A jar of warm tang. <laughs> And some, a, a bag. some room temperature venison in a in a Ziploc plastic bag that you would normally find marijuana in, <laughs> you know. And and you didn't at call three o'clock in the morning at the <laughs> at the uh, the big rock radio shift. You didn't think that that was going to that that should have been the title of the first record, "Warm Venison and Tang." I mean, you know. I don't know about that. <laughs> I remember that, yeah. So yeah, he, Joey had a lot of good records too. He had probably cooler records, you know. He he had a, he had a lot of AC/DC records and Lou Reed records and that kind of thing. And so uh, yeah, you know, we 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 got an apartment together. Eventually, merged our record collections, you know. And uh, you know, I think Joey even still has some of my old records. I do. Yeah, I do. Because uh, you know, because we started touring around right when CDs came started to come out, and then. So we kind of stopped collecting vinyl records, at least I did, because it was too inconvenient. To, we had these, you know, the CDs and cassettes that, that, that was, you could throw that in your suitcase. Sorry. And um, can we get a rag over here, please? <laughs> Sorry, I'm standing here. I hurt my knee last week. So for some reason, this stool, I could tell, is just going to make my knee hurt more. So I'm kind of, that's why I'm hovering over here. <laughs> it's not just because I'm trying to be weird or whatever. <clears throat> So, so, David, what did you make out of these two guys when you first started? Uh... Uh, uh, well, it's interesting because, you know, um, it took me, I think, a couple of, I think a week until I, oh, yeah, I had these songs. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I was in college at the time, so I started just, oh, yeah, this is cool, the band. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Red and and it's just, it's just scribbling and thinking about it all the time. So, yeah, it just, it, it, yeah, I loved it, yeah. Weren't you like a prog rock guy or something? Well, I played a lot of Russian stuff, so <laughs> early on, early Pixies was but over time, it's less is more, so yeah. he just learned, that's the way it goes, you just learn it, that's, yeah, you can't do all that stuff, so. So, the, but musically, it it worked right away, or did you, it was, was were you more into his personality or his playing initially? If you were, if you were like, were you able to integrate into? Well, I think the first meeting was over Kim's apartment, and there was a Lindrum. There wasn't a drum set; it was just a Lindrum and an acoustic guitar. They were playing on, and I think I was stoned. And 
and, and, and but, but, it, <laughs> but it all worked out. And it, yeah. I, I, I wanted to ask Joey about um, you know the origins the origins of your uh, your your sound and. I mean, when we first heard the first Pixies record, it was really like sort of nothing else, you know, as a as a total self-confessed nar- uh, guitar nerd that that we'd heard before. Um, and it was especially sort of your use of of feedback and overtones, and mm-hmm. and and I'm, I'm sort of wondering what, what where that came from. Like, um, you know, the only person I think at that time that I'd heard that was like Jimi Hendrix or something like that, you know? Where did that sort of noisy, dissonant part of your playing come from? Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> and also, you know, in, um, now I, I do remember that, you know, the, the, the out-of-tune thing where like, the notes wiggle a little bit. Yeah. I started, uh, I, I, I was playing that when, when the guitar's out-of-tune a little, I, I liked it. I liked that, that the little thing, so, you know, I just... Was sort of your version of the blues, it. like when they bend the note out of tune, it creates tension, right? Yeah, I like the the, the thing in the middle where it's out of tune. Yeah, you know that that little ripple thing. You know, I I, I like when it kind of rips and yeah. rips down. Yeah, know? yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? That's what I like. On the uh, first couple Pixies records, you barely play ryth- rhythm. I mean, you made yourself almost a, a a very difficult task. You play what could be qualified as lead guitar all the way through, was that um, a conscious decision? I'm not no. going to become a chord guy? <laughs> I didn't know any better. I mean, we didn't know any better. I mean, I thought my job was not, I mean, the thing is, is like not to play rhythm. I don't, I don't think I was that good at rhythm, maybe. Maybe it was better. Eh, I don't know. I just find it more interesting. Whatever, I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, uh, I just find it more interesting. It, it seems like it was working for you. Yeah, it was working. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I heard, so, you know, just on YouTube and uh, some early performances of the band, and I was struck by just how great it sounded in terms of, uh, you know, everybody's, uh, the, the tones on the guitars, and the orchestration of it right from the very beginning. It seemed like you guys had this great concept. I mean, you heard Kim's bass loud and clear. You occupied another uh, range in, in, in uh, uh, Charles Great singing. But um, I mean, how did, how did that sound? Did you guys spend a lot of time working out the actual tones and the, the sound of your playing? Or did that just come together organically? Uh, you know, we our first record. You know, we uh, uh, we we uh, was done in a weekend. Uh, we were told to bring sleeping bags because it wasn't safe to step outside of where the this particular studio was located uh, after uh, sunset. So, you know, I don't know. I think we were just happy because it was like a sleepover, <laughs> and it was at a and at a recording studio. And, you know, I don't know, it was fun. I mean, I don't know that we kind of sat around and like analyzed all, I mean, yeah, oh, that sounds really good. Oh, that doesn't sound good. Oh, this sounds, that oh, doesn't sound great. You know what I mean? It's, it's sort of on that level. It's not really on the level of, well, the way I'm envisioning it in my head, I was dreaming last night of the sound. Yes. You know, it was more like, hey, we got a band. Hey, we got we're gonna we got a gig. Hey, we hey we're playing Friday night. Hey, we got a gig. Hey, we hey we're gonna go. Hey, we're gonna go to London. Yeah. We're going to London. Woo! <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? Like yeah, it's just a, it was just a chemistry. It was it was more about the chemistry, and mm-hmm. just generally just feeling around everybody else is playing. There's, there's no formulation. I don't yeah. think in anything. Yeah. That we do. It's just, that's the way it <laughs> yeah, is. That's a good way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to say it like that. I don't mean to say it that. That's perfect. That's they don't know what they're doing. Perfectly. Honestly, I mean, when we, put st- when we put stuff down in the studio, we're just shocked if it sounds good. You know, that's it. It's yeah. like, whoa, Jesus, that's, that <laughs> sounds really good. That's it. That's all we, go- we base anything on, really. Was there any downside for you guys? It happened really fast. 
and you you form the band you were signed you're, you're big in Europe was there any downside to having it just go so smoothly versus having to grind it out for a couple of years in terms of how you guys got to know each other, et cetera. I think we much would have preferred to pay our dues for about 15 years slugging it out. <laughs> you know, I think that that would have like been better for us personally, you know. Some covers. <laughs> yeah, no, we were, we were really happy. Uh -huh. People clapped at our first show. We're like, okay, good, I guess we're a band. So, uh, so we just, we've been doing it ever ever since, you know, ever since we could get our first little show or whatever it was, our first little recording session. Oh, record label, a little artsy label in London's going to put out our... Great, all right. We, gotta, we were on tour uh, even before we had any business being on tour, you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. that's what you do is you get out of town, you know? And I remember David, David's father was a sign painter and he made up these uh, custom signs for us. So the Pixies, on tour! <laughs> How embarrassing. <laughs> Stuck to the side of our van. We had a mattress in the back that we slept on, and, you know, we would put the gear. How did it work? You put the, the drivers would go in the front, and then you put the... Yeah, I put a board. So we had a van. It was just a cargo van. So you think of all the equipment, it's going to, you know, it could crush somebody. Because if you want one mattress in the back, and the way it went was the, the mattress was the last so the, the equipment was first, right behind the driver's seats. There was a board separating then a mattress. So if you crash into something, <laughs> well, I guess the front drivers would get crashed by, crushed by the equipment, but the, the guy, whoever's in the back on the, on the bed <laughs> won't be, so. David did a lot of the driving. David's a very reasonable driver. Well, growing up in, in Massachusetts, he can drive anywhere, so. <laughs> um, so, uh, I sort of wondered how, you know, you came in uh, past to, to the band. Uh, you know, was, was Kim's playing you as a bassist? Was she an influence before you joined the Pixies? Was it somebody that you liked her sensibility or? Sure, I mean, she was definitely a big part of my upbringing. Um, in the very beginning, I, I wasn't playing with a pick. Um, it wasn't until later that I uh, realized um, this whole world of playing with the pick. And that's when I started really listening to a lot of more bass playing with picks. And, um, but yeah, I've always loved the Pixies. I remember when I got my first record. And, and live, do you feel, are, are you very faithful to, to the to Source materials. Yeah. yeah, to the record. Definitely went inside of the record, like every breath of every, you know, every part. And, um, Peer pressure, because we're all doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes I'm like, wait, I think it went, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it was really fun to go through all the records and all the songs and really dissect it into the bass parts and the singing mm -hmm. um, and then bring it to life you know, with my own voice and my own presence and um, taking it um, forward, moving it forward, continuing an awesome band. And so I've got one more I, question and then we're gonna put it, turn it over to the audience. So <clears throat> uh, in a bunch of interviews uh, online, it, it seems like David Bowie would have liked to have been in, in the Pixies. Would, would any of the Pixies like to have been David Bowie? <laughs> would any of what? Would, would any of you like to have been David Bowie? You mean to be him, to switch bodies? Yes, exactly. <laughs> Do that whole thing? Yeah. I mean, I, I really love him, but I also like, like being in the Pixies. Uh, I'm just being me, you know. And just thumbing <laughs> your nose at David Bowie because you're actually in the Pixies and he's not. <laughs> just <Yeah. for> <laughs> I'll do it for one season. <laughs> Spring in Paris, be Bowie, which is for, uh, you know, that was three months to check it out. No, Charles? I'm still trying to, like, to, like I'm going to just wait, get up, and then he's, we're going we're to switch? Yes. Or, yes. Or you're switch a room? Yeah. I don't know. I, I, that seems complicated. <laughs> 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 it is very complicated. 
However, there are new machines that actually can do such a yep. thing. I'm, 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 I'm going to kick kidding. it old school and just stay where I am. <laughs> You'll okay. have to learn all new songs, Charles. <laughs> uh, okay, so we'll turn it over to the audience. Anybody out there? Oh, here we go. Hi, so uh, we saw you in Philly last night. Great show. Um, after so many years of working with Gil Norton and the same producer for on so many records, what was it like? Was there any funny stories, anything super creative, working with a new producer recording a new record? Well, I guess not. He's a younger guy, and uh, Tom is his name, and he's he's definitely somehow won our confidence over very quickly. So. We just kind of let him run the show in a lot of ways. And um, that's nice when you can have that kind of a relationship with the producer and not have it always be about uh, having a standoff about something. You know what I mean? Although we did, Paz and I did corner him on one <laughs> particular uh, note. But uh, other than that, I mean, I think uh, we never even listened to the record at the end of the day when we were done working. We would just be like, oh, gee, it's 7 o'clock. Time to stop. See you later. You know, or, you know, we go have dinner or whatever. And even when he mixed the record, like, we trusted him so much that we were just like, eh, just mix the record and send it to us. You know what I mean? We, we trust you. And, you know, we maybe threw in our two cents, maybe, you know, just to symbolically, well, you know, you could turn, turn me up a little bit in that one song, you know. But, you know, we had a very good relationship with him. So it wasn't, uh, which is, I guess, unusual because we only met him you know, six months before that. So that's kind of nice that it worked out that way. So we didn't have you bring your sleeping bags this time? Yeah. No, we, uh, we didn't have, where we, I see. We, we had a little apartment ex attached to the, uh, to the recording studio where the three of us lived. Uh, it was really fun. Got to listen to music, play, um, he has some old records and make some food, make some coffee. You have about the, music. You had the Paul McCartney song. suite, is that correct? I had the, yeah, I slept. Uh, my little room was where Paul McCartney apparently lived for about two months when he was, um, in, you know, hiding from the paparazzi or something. Great. Well, I yeah. play with a pick, too. And the new record's <laughs> awesome. Thank you. <laughs> hey, guys. Um, so I was just wondering... Um, I know that your music also was in, you know, was influenced by like with other bands too, uh, with Radiohead as an example. Um, I was just wondering, how does it feel knowing that you know your music is also being, you know, like uh, being part of these other bands? Hmm. Well, I don't know. I, I guess we don't. I guess I don't really think about that much. But that's. I think that that's a lot of people in bands are are music geeks, you know, uh, even the even the real famous ones, you know. So it's like, you know, they have their records that they obsess on and you have records that you obsess on or bands that you obsess on. And then you go to do your thing and then you you kind of maybe sometimes you try to imitate one of them and hopefully it doesn't come out anything like them. But I mean, you know, so I think that's kind of how it works, basically, is you like other bands and you go, I want to be in a band too. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's always nice if, if someone drops your name, but it's not like unusual. It's like, oh yeah, of course they like my band or, or they like a band and it happens to be a band that I'm in. But that's just how, that's how we mm -hmm. got to be in bands. It was because we were obsessed with records and obsessed with uh, that particular subculture. One more question? Yeah. Hi guys. Um, firstly, just congrats on Head Carrier, one of my favorite albums of last year. It's incredible. Nice. Really excited to see it. First time for me tonight live at Webster Hall um, with the new material. Um, my question is, as we've been talking about, so many um, bands have, have, have mentioned you guys as influences on their music. Um, going into Head Carrier, I'd love to get a sense of some of the music maybe that you've been listening to going into the studio and the writing process. You know, you mentioned Hendrix back in the day, but maybe some modern day influences that have carried through into the sound of this incredible album. You'd be surprised. As, uh, my, mine wasn't rock and roll at all. You know, I mean, I was, uh, I'm, I'm, I was into Steve Reich and we were into Moondog and 
I mean, I'm going to be honest. I, I was listening to all the Pixies records, Good. you know, nonstop. <laughs> it was like pretty much the only thing on my iPod. So, um, yes, I was pretty obsessed with all the Pixies records from the beginning. But that's, you know, me. <laughs> I'm sure the other guys weren't listening to their their records from the past. So. I actually just, I mean, this was probably seven months ago I heard Where Is My Mind? And I realized for the, since 2004, I've been, I haven't been playing it right. <laughs> so, but I, <laughs> little hi hat opens every time. So we, we, I've been doing it ever since. So it's uh, <laughs> good. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Well, thanks, guys, for uh, for joining us. It was great talking to you, and uh, thanks everybody for uh, for coming down. Let's hear it for the Pixies, man. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.